So I'm, before you start recording, oh, never mind. It's the sign came up that said now this we're meeting is recorded. All right. You can call me up on the phone and um, tell me what you were going to say <laughs> if you want. It's not important. Okay. Um, so we're recording this. And um, since so many people couldn't make it last time, I'm going to review a few of the things that we went over. So for you, one or two, you've already heard, but mm -hmm. if you have That's any- okay. Okay. It doesn't you, bother me to hear it again. I know, me too. So quit looking at your book for a oh, minute, Melanie, okay. and press the button so we can see Jordan's photo, first okay. of all. So this way, the people that weren't here last time can get to see Jordan's assignment. The, some of you may remember I had assigned my grandson on the West Coast, San Diego, because their skies are more often clearer than ours, to have a year-long assignment, assuming he didn't move, from the same window, the camera in the same exact spot, aimed in the same direction, to record where the moon rose from the eastern horizon. So now we all can see what the window facing east in San Diego, where Jordan lives, looks like a typical alley with garages and trash bins, et cetera, and what, a lot of electric lines. But there, centered in the distance, is the full moon rising. Now, okay, Mary Lou, we'll ask you, let's leave this picture on oh. for people. Mary Lou, do you remember what Jordan's main concern was? That yes, he, took... he said that the, the moon really looked orange, but in the picture, it just looks normal. Right, not as orange. What else did he say was quite different from what he saw with his eyes and what the camera recorded? Do you remember that? That I don't remember. Okay. So, he said okay. it looked a lot smaller. Or it was larger? The moon was larger? His Which eyes perceived it in, as um, larger. And the yeah. camera said, no, this is what it really looks like. Yeah. Way back, I don't know, maybe third or fourth session back in the early spring, we talked about the moon and that optical illusion when, especially the full moon on the horizon, somehow mm -hmm. seems a lot bigger, fatter yeah. than it does later in the night when it's higher in the sky. And I had jokingly suggested to Brock, who lives out there with Jordan, he's eight years old, that he go out to the park where he can spot the rising moon, turn his back to it, stand upside down and look at the moon <laughs> through his legs. Remember that? Yeah. And um, see if it looked any different. And then I said, well, of course, if you're embarrassed to do that, you could simply hold your pinky up to the sky, both at the moonrise and then five, six, seven hours later at night when it's high in the sky, and you will realize, you know, the moon really didn't change in size. Somehow my eyes made it appear bigger when it was close to the horizon. And I had never thought about the camera not being the eye. Yeah, yeah. And therefore would record. I was always told that it was because of the atmosphere that made the moon seem larger. Um, no, I don't think that was true. The atmosphere does change the color. Yeah, right. The, yes, but it seems to be, and they're not exactly sure, they're still mumbling around about why. Um, but it seems to be something to do with an optical illusion when the moon is close to other things like those palm yeah. trees and, or a rooftop that somehow that distorts our perception of it hmm. when it's way up high in the sky and there's nothing yeah. there yeah. it's yeah. more realistic okay so that was jordan's uh, moon adventure um before we move on to um looking at some of the newer material for today I wanted to review what Bob Heipel had researched and just clarify it again. And maybe sometime in the winter, especially as we, we all learn how to use a telescope to find what's up there in a very tiny spot in the sky, um, what a nebula is. Because maybe at the star party coming up next week, we will be able to actually with our binoculars see some nebula nebulae, whatever the plural is. But nebula are basically- Do you, you want the cat's eye? Yeah, why, um, oh, wait, no, that's not the cat's eye. 
Okay, yeah, put the cat's eye up. Oh, oops, and Mary Lou again. Oh. Well, there's Regina. Yeah, I just uh, got here. Oh, good. We're, we're doing a little review because last time not many people were able to attend and we for, whoops, and we forgot to um, record. So I'm just briefly going over some of the material. Um, I'm, I was going to give the definition of a nebula and we're looking at one, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but basically a nebula is a huge cloud of gas and dust. Not, you know, it's almost a vacuum really from our point of view, but it's out there, some gas and some dust. And we have two types of nebula, if you're taking notes. One is called a radiation nebula. And why we can see it is that the stars that are embedded in that cloud are radiating energy, which ionize the gas in the cloud. In other words, <laughs> kick off some of the hydrogen electrons. And when that happens, the resulting energy that we see is the red wavelength. So some nebula give off a red color from the ionized hydrogen gas. The other type of nebula is a reflection nebula. And that's when the starlight from that inside that nebula, all those millions of stars that occupy the space are giving off light that's reflected from the dust. And when this happens, we see mainly blue light, like we see our sky being blue for somewhat the same reason. And once again, that sounds to me like a winter topic. Mommy, why is the sky blue? And we're not gonna say because that's God's favorite color because that's not the answer. <laughs> All right. So those are the two definitions of the main type of nebula we have, radiation, which come through red, and reflective, which comes through blue. One because the gas is being ionized, the other because the light's bouncing off the dust in the cloud. And if you want to look up online, our most famous in the Northern Hemisphere, you know, it's always local, the Orion Nebula. M43 and its cousin M42. They're kind of like right next to each other in the sword below the belt in Orion. We looked at that last winter, probably session one is my guess. Alrighty, now, does anybody know the name <laughs> of this nebula we're looking at that Melanie found for us? What was a nebula everybody had the assignment last time to go find because there was a mix up on what it really was. Cat, cat's eye? Yes, the cat's eye. And that was to some extent my fault, but not really my fault. Here's the history of this. And I think it's important because you can't always trust what you read. Um, I have several books on astronomy. I've kept the best, passed on the ones that I thought weren't as good or as clear or had his great pictures or whatever. And in a book written about 20 years ago by a high school um, science teacher who is an amateur astronomer, he has lots and lots and lots of good information. And I used his books many, many times. And in rereading them a month or so ago, he said, the cat's eye nebula was M4 in Scorpio which is a globular cluster, by the way, which we will see next week sometime at our star party. And I said, really? And then we, the few of us that were here, I questioned that, how could that be? And then I thought, well, the only way a cat's eye, you know, cat's eyes, thin slits in the bright light, the iris, the black, and then big round black irises when they're in the dim light. And I thought, well, maybe in front of this globular cluster way out there in the halo, is a streak of dark gases that would create the cat's eye. So that satisfied me last week. And I said, 
Oh, okay. Then, I don't know who you are, but somebody left 2015, a whole year of Astronomy Magazine out of the kitty stand here by the library. I call it the kitty stand. You know what I mean. Oh. And I was going through the 12 years, no, 12 months from 15, 20, 15, 16 years ago. And lo and behold, there was an article on nebula or nebulae. And in it, this very learned man, credentials <laughs> that you could believe him more than the poor fellow from Oregon, said the cat's eye is a planetary nebula found in Draco. So you want to write that down, D-R-A-C-O. That's one of the constellations that goes around Polaris along with the Big Dipper and Cassiopeia and the crowd. So there are five major constellations that are circumpolar around the pole star and Draco is one of them. And in Draco is this beautiful planetary nebula named the cat's eye. And Melanie found this. I found it in my book also um, to double check. And to just explain what happened here, I forget how long ago, millions and millions and millions and millions of years ago, there was a star that reached the end of its life, created a nova or a supernova, blew up, and created this shell, a sphere of expanding gas and dust that radiated out from the center of where that star had been, which we now see in the center as a white dwarf, I believe. And all the radiation and the original explosion created this beautiful shell, which we see as rings with the white dwarf in the center. So, the, um, Regina, I saw you a few days ago at Bird Club and in passing said, did you want to do some research about trusting what you read and is it always true? So are you there, Regina, what, on the phone? Yes, I'm here on the phone. I'm outside the library. Okay, we well, And I would love to do that. Yeah, I would love to do that. I just did not have the opportunity since I talked to you. Okay, we'll, we'll put that on hold then and that'll be your assignment for next time. Um, because I think it's very important, especially in this day and age, when it's hard to know what to trust just by yeah, what you hear you. or what you read. So this is a good example. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to ask Melanie. She had a lot of homework to do to find things to put them up on the computer for you guys. Does that mean Sandy's here? Yep. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Mary Lou. I'm good. We're doing a little review because so many people missed last time, but this is, I think, pretty new. Um, Melanie has found the Greek alphabet for us, so she's going to put it up on the screen. And right. if some of you want, it's only going to be the first five letters of the Greek alphabet. Oh, it's going to be the whole thing. We're well, just going to look at the. We're going to look at the first five, which is in the top row. Um, for uh, although the Chinese and probably some of the Arabs. We're way ahead of us in astronomy. Um, and I'm sure there were some other cultures that we've somehow, because we're not connected to them as well, and they didn't have written records, we've lost. But the Greeks were in there pretty early, 3,000 or so years ago. And their Greek alphabet was used <clears throat> in several ways. And one of which was, if we just look at the, I'm gonna only ask you to write down the first five, the alpha the beta, they're easy. They look like our A's and B's. And then you have that gamma, which is like a Y. And then delta, which probably is on that airplane, the delta airplane <laughs> symbol, I would guess. And epsilon, which is an E. So those first five letters and how do astronomers use them? And I did know two weeks ago and I have forgotten um, who it was. I think it was a Greek and I think it was 2,500 years ago, but you can double check me on that first came up with this system and he said, and it was a he. All right, we have all these constellations up there, like Orion, like Scorpio. The brightest star in the constellation will have a name, but it'll also have a designation, the alpha star. And the next brightest, and most of those alpha stars at least um, magnitude one or less, minus one. 
And then you have the beta stars, second brightest on down, third, fourth, and we're only gonna to go to the fifth brightest, um, all of which you can see with your naked eye. But I'm guessing, once again, you can check it, that the epsilon stars are probably magnitude four. And so you need clear skies and fairly decent eyes to see them with your naked eye. So we're going to, that's another way of talking about the stars up there besides their name. It's the alpha star. What did I, okay, I gave Melanie some homework oh. here <laughs> before we turned on. Um, what, what did I ask you? Which, the alpha star in Taurus. Okay, um, we, I picked Taurus. We're not looking at Taurus now. That's a winter constellation, but that was off the top of my head. And I asked her, what is the alpha star in the constellation Taurus, the bull? And it is Aldebaran. Okay, now can you all hear that? Yeah. All right, Aldebaran, or however you pronounce that, which we also talked about last winter. Why don't you show them the book that you've oh. got, Melanie, and where you found this book? And <laughs> This is my little book. It's called The Night Sky, A Field Guide to the Constellations. I got this at a little store in Wellsboro called Pop Culture. <laughs> She was dragged in there kicking and screaming by her husband Yes, because he likes whatever they sell. And she was thinking, I'm never going to find anything in here that I want. And what's the other book you found? I like that. I think I like that one. I found Stars, a month-by-month -month tour of the constellations. And it's a ring. It calls it a ring yeah. binder. A ring binder. And the pages are not just a thin paper. They're it's thick kind of and they're shiny. So if you spill your soda or whatever, you can wipe it off. Anyway, what's this? It um, has like the oh. star chart. Yeah, Leo, the, uh, can they, they see this if I like that? Yep. Leo the line, etc. Right. And so it just is nice and handy. It doesn't break the binding. Yeah, like I just did to my little book. Oh, you just broke, oh. Yeah. Oh, well, they do not make books like they used to make, mm -hmm. just like everything in this world these days. Yeah. Thank you. I agree. <laughs> All righty. So, um, let me turn over to my question. All righty, here are some questions. And I forget, there was only Mary Lou here, I believe, and Jordan, who must be sleeping in. Wait till I get hold of him tonight on the phone um, for today. And then I've stuck Melanie with ask, answering some of them. Melanie, what did I just ask you? The distance to the Andromeda galaxy. All right, let me get down to that question. <clears throat> Where is that question? Go on. What is it? <laughs> um, the, the distance to the Andromeda galaxy is 2.5 million light years. 2.5. That's two and a half million years ago before Homo sapiens were tromping around. The, the light we now see with our naked eye in a clear sky. And we'll, in another month or two, we'll be out there looking at it, came from the past. And on Earth, two and a half million years ago, is when Handyman, Homo habilis, our ancient Homo ancestor, walking along a creek bed in East Africa, looked down, saw a little stone about two inches in diameter, somewhat flat, somewhat concave, with some depressions, and saw a face. And picked it up and brought it back to camp, where it was found two and a half millions later in an archeological dig. So the light we are seeing from Andromeda left there around the time Homo habilis was evolving in East Africa beginning to think, beginning to use tools. All right, what else did I ask about Andromeda? How many stars are in the galaxy, Andromeda galaxy? Mm -hmm. um, this book says 200 billion. Ah. This book says 200 to 400 billion. Do you have dates on these two books? Because um, when I first studied astronomy my god how many half a century ago we knew so much less than we know now 
just like we didn't know that the dinosaurs were wiped out by an asteroid that hit the earth down by the Yucatan 65 million years ago. And so the more recent books, if they're good books, ought to have more up-to-date knowledge. This was revised in 2018. This was published in 2014. Okay, so, and this is the one with the- 200 billion. Okay, and that? 200 to 400 billion. All right. Another possibility for the discrepancy. Like this, this book does say, this book does say. Uh, let me find it again. Well, she finds that. It does say that um, that 200 to 400 billion stars is our best guess. Right. <laughs> now, partly would depend on the astronomers who either wrote this book or were the, um, what do you call it, when a writer has sources. Mm -hmm. um, back check? Not back check. Um, uh, what's the word? When, when you're the authority, whether it's for a movie script or whatever, um, you're the knowledgeable person and the person who's writing is a good writer and might know a little bit, but you provide the expertise. It, different um, astronomy uh, telescopes have different powers and different mm. abilities and what different parts of the world where those telescopes are, they mm -hmm. focus on different aspects of astronomy. So depending mm -hmm. on where you got your basic information, maybe your telescope crew were more up to date mm -hmm. or that was their area of expertise. Mm -hmm. And I, um, we're getting off on Andromeda more than I planned, but that's okay, I guess. Just very recently, with once again, and I forget which telescope and where, or maybe it was Hubble up in the sky. Hubble's the one in the sky, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Have so probably with, most accurate. with new cameras and et cetera, et cetera, and new techniques, they suddenly realized that Andromeda, unlike our Milky Way, is really twice as wide or the diameter of the sphere, not the sphere, the disc is twice what they thought it was then that would mean more stars. Mm -hmm. So, but we can talk about that in depth when we've all had more time to um, review that. Um, <clears throat> let's put up our summer triangle now. Did anybody look that up? Um, I had asked for the three main stars in the summer triangle. Yes, that, that was mine. Okay, is that you, Mary Lou? Yes. Okay, and what were they? The question we have was a... to name the alpha stars. Okay. In, in... In Cygnus, it is Deneb, which is oh, the oh. tail. Can you, wait a second. Can you point that mm -hmm. out with your pointer? Okay. Uh, Deneb is in the tail of an outline Cygnus that's for people. Cygnus, the swan. Yeah, the swan, that's its head. And by the way, let's go down to the head, Mer Melanie. That's <laughs> poor, poor Melanie's going to have to find Alberio for us with the telescope or somebody will, so we can see the double blue orange um, binary stars. Ta da Okay, so Deneb is the alpha star, the brightest. What's next? And Vega is the alpha star in Lyra, the harp. Yes. And Aquila, no, mm -hmm. Altair. Altair is the, is the alpha star in Aquila, the eagle. Okay, um, two things that I can add to this. You see how the Milky Way runs down through that? Yeah. And then see here, run through the dark rift. Mm -hmm. This is called the Great Rift. And it blocks out the light of the stars in the Milky Way behind it because it's a dark dust cloud. It's called the Great Rift. And you can see it if you go out on a clear night, especially in the summer and look up <coughs> overhead pretty much from the, mm, let me think, northeast to southwest. This goes northeast to southwest um, from Deneb down to Altair. Um, you can see the break in the Milky Way, the silver road, as the Chinese call it. Um, and it's just a dust cloud? It's a dust cloud. Yeah, a nebula, dust cloud. Well, no, a dust cloud, I guess, rather than a nebula as such. And it's fairly long and somewhat skinny. Now, the neat thing about Vega up here at the top in the lyre is that, and, and once again, in the winter, <laughs> um, we'll have time for these kind of 
um, I don't know what you'd want to call them, more in-depth kind of look at the stars. Right now, the way the Earth spins on its axis, the North Pole, as we know, anybody out there, where, at what star does the North Pole point? Polaris. Polaris, that's right, uh, the pole star. But in 8,000 years from now, due to the wobble, remember the top spinning on the table, the, the axis wobbles, creates like if, if you had a laser pointer on the top handle of the top as it spun, it would inscribe on the ceiling a small circle. And right now, the laser beam from the top of the axis, our North Pole, would point to Polaris out there in the sky. But in 8,000 years, it's going to point to Vega. Wow. <laughs> yes. So if you're curious about this, once again, you can look up online. It's called, if I'm correct, the procession of the axis or the procession of the pole stars. And it will give you a circle in the sky for every whatever it is. I forget what the full cycle will be before we get back to Polaris. Somebody could let me know. Is it 32,000 years? Hmm. I looked that up. Okay, so that Vega is the future pole star for better or worse. <laughs> okay. So now then, forget that yellow line that outlines the summer triangle and just take a look at Cygnus and in your mind's eye, rotate it clockwise one fourth of the way so that Deneb is sitting up on top. Can we do that or not? Mm -hmm. Now, now I'm doing it in the mind's eye. Can you do yeah. it? We're going to mess around. Oh, oh there, that's good enough. Too tiny. Okay, well, that's okay. Now Deneb is hmm, standing on its head with its tail in the air and its wings horizontal. That's an asterism. Anybody know what it's called? And what's an asterism as a review for people who weren't here in the first sessions? It's a common name for something. Yes. And the, the asterism is the Northern Cross. Yes, it's a pattern that we see with our yeah. eyes. And it's part of usually, not always, but usually part of one constellation. Sometimes it's part of two constellations. And I think once in a blue moon, it's just all by its, is it possible? To be? No, it can't be all by itself because I think they've cut up the sky into constellation patterns and um, everything fits in one or the other, I believe, I think. So, um, in the constellation Cygnus the Swan is the, uh, the asterism of the Northern Cross. And you can see why they would see it that way. So your assignment is sometime when it's a clear night, go out and look to the, I think it's in the Northeast, rising up there, relatively getting high now, and see if you can see the Northern Cross. I see it almost every night when the sky is clear. Yes, it's, it's uh, it, I think I read about the, the summer triangle is because those three stars are so bright, especially Vega, that sailors in the old days before modern technology, in the um, late springs and summer to the early fall, um, partly could tell time by when those three stars the, of the three constellations became visible. Um, that marked a certain time in the night, the nautical uh, twilight or something. We'll look that up too sometime. Okay. Um, what time is that? Okay. Chugging along here. Uh, some interesting things about Aquila. You want to turn that around the way it was? Ta da. Whoops. Can we make it bigger like that or not? Is this big enough for you all to see? Yes. Okay. Aquila. In, no, let's see. Altair in Aquila, the constellation, the eagle, Altair, has a very interesting length of day. 
it's a star remember so like the earth the, and like the sun it spins um i believe it has one of the shortest days for a star in our soul in our uh, solar um, universe and our well in our milky way galaxy anybody want to guess she's trying to look it up well oh. that was pipel's Question. question they leave you his answers no he didn't he forgot oh. and i forgot to ask him okay. well it's only six and a half days earth days and six and a half earth days aquila spins around on its axis a, a, a big star um so it's pretty fast one of the fastest in our milky way galaxy now think of this think of the earth are we guys a perfect sphere no 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 it's more no. of an elliptical okay i'm not talking about orbit i'm talking about the shape of our earth well, if we okay. were the in the middle it's wider at the pole at the equator than it is at the pole than taller at the poles yeah, yeah it bulges it, it bulges where yeah. regina in the in middle in the equator yes it's like a centrifugal force. You know, the guys at the end of the skating rink, if they let go, they fly off, you know, because of the centrifugal force. So even the earth, which is relatively solid, at least the outer core, there's some give. And due to the spin, the distance from the North Pole to the South Pole, once again, if you want, you could check it. I think it's something like 30, 40, 50 miles shorter than the distance from right through the middle from equator to equator. So if out there is spinning so much faster and being a star, it's made of gas, probably no solid parts, I don't think. What is it, the shape of the star? Want to extrapolate Regina on <laughs> compared to the earth? Well, I would think maybe more like a disc. That's a guess. You're getting there. Yes. Um, the distance from through the equator from side to side is two times the distance from the top pole to the bottom pole. So it's a really okay. it's an oval shape that's twice as wide as it is high because of the centrifugal hmm. force and the, the, um, the rapidity at which it runs around. Now then, I don't remember if Anne was supposed to answer this one, but I'll just answer it. A day on the sun, we don't usually think of the sun has having a day, but meaning once the sun rotates, that does it in 25 Earth days. So if we start on day one of a month, 20, the 25th of the month, the same red, the same um, dark spot or mm -hmm. storm, or whatever would be facing us again. It takes 25 days for the sun to go around itself once. Alrighty. Before we go on to today's, I want to um, take a vote on our next week's possibly star party. So what I did was, oh, here's Jordan. Jordan's tuned in. Oh, good, Jordan, hi. Oh, he's still joining. Oh, he's still joining. Okay, he got up late, ha ha. Okay, the star party, um number one it depends on when the full moon is we don't want to do like last time when the full moon pops up a half hour after we're there um so it does get dark earlier a whole hour earlier than it did two months ago and the moon is full on sunday so i figured we'd start the possible days on tuesday wednesday thursday Friday, because after the moon, the big deal is, of course, the weather. As, as Melanie said earlier when we were doing this, the um, Mother Nature is the one that rules when we have our star party because they, and Sandy's nodding. So, what I did is I made a chart and we'll go down. Everybody that's here. And what I wanted to do is like handicapping a race. There were a handful of people for a variety of reasons that couldn't come to our last star party. So, I was going to give them preference if it came down to that. So I've already asked Melanie, Rima, are you free for a minute or not? Oh, she's outside. Rima. 
That's okay. She's outside. Yeah. Okay. I'll find what do you out. want to ask her? She's right here. What day of the week, Tuesday through Friday, would be best for her for a star party next week? What day of the week would be best for a star party for you next week, Tuesday through Friday? She's. You already working. talked to. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Never oh. mind. Never mind. Absent minded here. All righty. Regina? Whatever. Um, Assuming you may come with Mary Lou or whoever, when would be the best day for you? Uh, it doesn't really matter. Okay, I so I'm gonna I'm gonna check off time, it doesn't matter. Four. Mary Lou Cartledge, when's the best day for you? I can't make it on Thursday. Okay, so I'll six. cross out Thursday. Yes. Um well, Sandy, um, are you gonna be around next week or are you in Albany? Or wherever? Can't hear you. Sandy, can't hear you. <laughs> I I think so, but Tuesday would be the most likely, probably. But I don't want to, you know, right. be the well, one to determine it. No, what I do is um, I I take Melanie important, uh, the most important, because she's got the telescope. Yep. So, yep. but other than that, we just see who has the many checks in the day. Okay. Okay. So um the best day for you would be tuesday okay yes hypos and debbie aren't here laura did you tune in today or not no i guess she didn't okay i'll have to find out well what i will do is i'll figure it out in the next two days and then melanie will put it on our web page for the zoom talks and it'll have to be like last time kind of depending on the weather let's say Everybody says Tuesday, the majority says Tuesday is the best day. But if it's going to be cloudy, we won't do it. So it'll kind of be, you have to check the website every morning to see what the weather is going to be. Okay. And so the first clear night will do it at my house because it has the Southern exposure opposite from what we saw at Sandy's. Any questions on that from anybody? Nope. Nope. Okay. All righty, August, let me just see here. Just to let you know, Mary Lou, the, the long-term yeah. forecast, <laughs> Monday has the, uh, the, looks like it has the least clouds, on, but it's hard to tell, it's hard to tell. Yeah, but Monday the moon will be in the way. Okay. Yeah, see the moon, Sunday, rises as the sun sets and the sun sets about you know you can check that i think it's about um eight o'clock roughly or quarter to eight and then it doesn't really get dark uh, then 50 minutes later the next night you see it's too comes up too early for us to be able to have a dark sky to see things before the moon comes up can i just say that sure since I was, it took forever for me to get connected because it wasn't working for me. But um, I, I did see that one clear night. Then the second night of the um, Perseid showers. Yes, and I good. Saw, You're the only one. Six, really, I saw six, but it was at, um, at like two thirty in the morning. I mean, yes, so, yeah. That's, that's when, the, the sky was like so clear. Uh -huh. Like I could see, you know, how everyone who was at the party, how foggy it was along. The, mm -hmm. I could see the Big Dipper right on the horizon there in the north. I mean, I, I saw everything just Good. like in the books. Oh, so you weren't in Albany. You were here. Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't see anything here. <laughs> <laughs> in Albany. You're in Albany now, right? I am. I am. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So you saw the Big Dipper and, and I know you were having a hard time seeing the distance. Um, because of your eyes uh, were it's harder for you to see the distant stars so it was clear enough for you to really see things everything everything so how many you said you saw six how bright were the showers where'd they come from yeah. in this you remember um from your porch they were right they were right around um right in the northwest i mean yeah okay right, they were right coming there. out of the One, couple were more overhead and the others were um towards the horizon but they weren't only one was 
sort of bright, you know, mm -hmm. like I've, in previous years, I've seen spectacular, you know, one spectacular one, which I, <laughs> I just didn't, but, but the night before, um, there were enough clouds and things that I didn't see any, yeah. yeah. I so. think one of the things about astronomy is like bird watching. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's about noon, about noontime, I went out why did I go out? I don't know, to put a wet towel out on the stones to dry in this humid weather. And I usually tend to look up, you know, when I go out, I think. And all of a sudden it was like, wow, what's that? And not only that, it was four of them. I think they were turkey vultures, but I'm not sure. But I'm going to call around and um, I kind of know what they look like. Or I'll look yeah. it up in the bird book. Sometimes they show silhouettes of the hawks and buzzards and whatnot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but they definitely were, and there were four of them, and they were headed west on, on the, the breeze up there. And with astronomy, you just never know the second, the half a minute, that if you happen to be outside and happen to look in the right direction, you'll see something amazing. And then it's gone. It's like, wow, did I just see something? <laughs> well, I'm glad you got to see a few. Uh, we had pretty hazy skies here most nights, so none of us saw anything. All righty. Jordan? Are you there, yeah. Jordan? Yeah. Okay. Um, Melanie found the cat's eye um, nebula and put up a nice picture as well as the summer triangle and the alpha beta, et cetera, Greek alphabet for naming the stars. So I think, by the way, I forgot to mention it when we went over that towards the beginning of the meeting. I think everybody, next time they go out and look at their favorite stars in the summer sky, um, maybe take your book or the page from whatever. Are we still doing the mm -hmm. monthly page? Mm -hmm. You can pick up here at the library or it's on the screen. Is it on the screen, the monthly? No. Oh, no, I don't have it. No. Maybe we could do that um, and see if you can find the alpha star either from a book or just looking at Scorpio, which is beginning to slip away to the west now. It's not straight overhead anymore at 10 o'clock. Um, and these three stars in uh, constellations in the summer triangle and spot with your own eyes, the alpha star, the brightest. All right. Um, and I forgot to mention, after we went all through this Greek who set it up, the alpha being the brightest in the constellation, the beta being the next brightest, every now and again. Jordan, maybe this would be an assignment for you. You like to research history. Every now and again, it doesn't work. The alpha star is not the brightest. And you're thinking, wait a minute, there was a system, a pattern. Why doesn't this one fit in? So if you want to, Jordan, you can research <clears throat> the origin of using the Greek alphabet to designate the brighter stars in a constellation, and then why some don't fit in. <clears throat> and I think Draco might be a perfect example. Um, oh, we can look that up later. Okay. <clears throat> All right, here are the questions, guys. We're running out of time for August 31st. Hmm, who am I going to give what? Okay. What, what did I give you one already, Melanie? Um, not for next time, no. All right. Okay. No, I already did the distance to the Andromeda galaxy, and you've already. Oh, yes. But you can use that for next time. Okay. okay? And the size and the number of stars. So yep. that was you, Melanie. All righty. Um, <clears throat> I'm just looking here to see. Um, ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum. Mary Lou, I'm going to pick stick you with a hard one, sort of. Okay. All righty. We were talking about galaxies, and and in a month or so we'll be studying the Andromeda galaxy and going out there and seeing it like we did last year some of you remember you were there remember mary lou i waved down the cop because he was driving too fast down the road in the dark <laughs> and there were like 10 of us out on the side of the road there yeah and he, he pulled to a stop and said um what's the matter can i help you <laughs> i 
cops said, yeah, you can slow down. <laughs> I, I didn't know it was a cop, but I would have said it anyway. Anyway, um, there are three, Mary Lou, main forms that galaxies take. What are they? Basically shape. All right, that's how they, they decide category one, two, or three by the shape of the galaxy. Okay? Okay. Okay. That's Mary Lou. Okay, Regina, ready? I'm right here. Okay. A revolution means the orbit, the time it takes a galaxy, just like a planet around the sun, the galaxy around its center. Um, what's the time of a full revolution for the Milky Way galaxy, which we just mentioned, and the Andromeda galaxy? So we'll compare those two. <clears throat> Can you repeat those? Yeah. Sure. Yours, Mary Lou, or just Regina's? No. Those, Regi the full revolution of the two galaxies. Right. The Andromeda, which we can see with our naked eye. The only thing we can really see with our naked eye that's not in our own Milky Way galaxy. And the Milky Way galaxy. So we have two galaxies out there, and they're both rotating around their centers. Mm -hmm. What? How long will it take to go once around the merry-go-round? <laughs> Okay, Sandy, ready? Yes. Okay. The Milky Way galaxy, you can abbreviate these, right? MWG. And our neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy, are moving towards each other. What are their velocities? And when will they meet? So how fast is the Andromeda galaxy moving towards us? How fast are we moving towards it? And how long in the future will it be before they merge? Uh, yes, got okay. it. for next time, for next time, not for now. Right, 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 but um, how when will they merge? Yeah, because they're moving towards each other. Right, but how about, what's the part about us? Okay, look at me. Beep, beep. I'm writing it down, okay. Mm -hmm. There are two galaxies out there in space. Yes. They're both moving and they're moving towards each other. Yes. Each at a different rate. It's like two cars, one going 30 miles an hour, one going 60. It's like that eighth grade math problem. And they're on the through way and the one's going the wrong way. When are they going to hit? <laughs> in other words, if one's going twice as fast as the other, it's not going to be halfway between where they are now, right? But they won't, there won't be like a shift when they get closer. Oh, well, there's different theories about what's going to happen. Okay. That you wouldn't think be. they could actually go, you'd think that like the forces would keep them from merging, but who knows? Okay. Who knows? And also, we always have to remember. It's mostly space. It's mostly space. Okay. It's so far away. It's see, we can see it, you know, as a fuzzy little ball in the sky. But if you were there, like in, in our own galaxy, we look out, there's nothing really that close, is there? <laughs> Sirius is, for us in the north, is the closest, but it's almost nine light years away. Do the multiplication of what a light year is. It's a long ways away. Yeah. Okay. And then what about you said something about what will it do to us or? Well, uh, no, I just said when will it arrive? I haven't asked okay. anybody to say what's going to happen. Okay. 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 <clears throat> All righty. Um, ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum. Okay. Jordan, that leaves. Who does that leave? Jordan, you are you the only one I haven't picked on yet? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
I don't know if you had tuned in soon enough to hear about the alpha, beta, um, ga uh, gamma, delta, epsilon star gauge or no, not? I missed that, but I'm going to watch the video. Okay, you can rewatch the video and it's also on the screen. She'll keep it up. The, um, the Greek alphabet with our alphabet for the first five and how alpha is usually the brightest, beta is the next on down to epsilon, which I think is magnitude four-ish. We can still see with our naked eye. What I want you to do then, write down the following three constellations and then list their alpha star, okay? Okay. Orion, Canis Major, that's the big dog. These are all winter constellations. And the Big Dipper, which is always there for us. And seeing Orion on my paper here reminds me of two things. One thing from, let me think almost 50 years or so ago. I spent the summer in Texas. And one night, it was in August, we were there for the summer for a program. And I had a mystery book that I couldn't put down. <laughs> so I read it through the night and finally finished the book at four in the morning down in Texas in August. And I went out to look at the stars and I didn't know much about astronomy in those days, really, and didn't think about it a lot. And by gosh, there on the eastern horizon, rising up in the pre-dawn light, was Orion, a winter constellation, which I had only seen in the past, you know, in November, December, January. And here it was only August, and there it was in the pre-dawn light. Well, a week ago, I was up at four in the morning, and I thought, oh yeah, if I look, it's clear tonight, I'm gonna to go look, I betcha, I'm gonna see a rising topping the trees to the east of my house. And sure enough, there it was lying on its side, the belt pretty much up and down. And that meant to do, to do, to do, Rigel, the blue white star in the foot or the knee was hanging there in the pre-dawn light. It was just beginning to get light. Sometime in the winter, we'll have one or two programs on time <laughs> and the movement of the stars and how it changes every night and celestial navigation and all those other wonderful topics, but not tonight, but okay. And you're, let's see, that's, is that three that I gave you, Orion, Canis Major and Big Dipper? Yeah. Okay, find if you want the alpha and the beta stars in those three constellations. Alrighty, the alpha one will be easy and it'll be ones, um, well, maybe the Big Dipper will be new, but the beta stars probably won't be that well known because they're not as bright, usually magnitude two. And we don't always, at least us common people, don't usually know the names of those stars. Does anybody have any questions, any observations? Did you see any of the Perseid meteor shower, Jordan, or not? In the city, you don't have as, you have a lot of light pollution. I didn't see it. Okay. Okay, we're just about out of time. So if nobody has any more questions, our next meeting will be, um, and by the way, did you put the, on the calendar a reminder for the meeting or not? And we should do that probably because some people are forgetting. Um, yeah, it's still up there. Okay. Yep. So if you check the website from time to time, Melanie has also included um, a reminder for today's meeting. Because last time, some people had other appointments, but I know one or two just forgot. Um, there may come the time when I forget. <laughs> Melanie will have to run the program or whatever. So Well, you won't learn very much. <laughs> I'll tell you that. No. Does anybody out there have any expertise with a telescope and how to find things in the sky that aren't the moon? Because I really, 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 really want to find Alberio 
the blue and orange binary star at the head of, uh, what is it? The swan, Cygnus. Cygnus. Yeah. I, uh, and there's also some other things. Everybody, by the way, um, let me know. Let me think. We should have a more accurate weather report by Sunday. So maybe Sunday night after dark, around 8.30 or so, give me a call and let me know. You know, uh, we'll, we'll try and tighten up when we're going to do our star talk. Definitely bring your binoculars because everything I have on the list, mm -hmm. except Alberio, we can see with our binoculars and then with our naked eyes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's it. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Jordan, give me a call later tonight. We got to talk politics. Okay. <laughs> you have been listening to the news, right? <laughs>